Today, once and for all, we are going to settle the argument of what causes the proximity effect. <laughs> Alright, so let's get started talking about the proximity effect. Now, if you remember in the last video I did about microphone design and construction, I mentioned that I wanted to do a whole standalone video on this topic because I think it is one, interesting, and two, there seems to be some confusion online of what actually causes the proximity effect. Now, if you YouTube why does the proximity effect happen, the first video that pops up with the most views is actually a really good video. and accurately describes the phenomenon. However, I'm doing this video because I think I could do a slightly better job at explaining it because it is kind of a confusing topic and I think I could bring it in an intuitive sense that even a lay person can understand. First, we need to define what the proximity effect is. And this is the rise in low end response when you take a directional microphone, such as a cardioid microphone or a figure eight microphone, and bring it close to a signal source. The closer you get to the source, the more the low end bass response is going to rise. You can use the proximity effect to your advantage in the recording studio, or it can be a complete nuisance. It's really going to depend on the situation that you are recording in. And I really don't want to dive deep into the applications of the proximity effect because there is a thousand and one videos on the internet about this topic. Instead, I really just want to focus on the physics of why this effect happens. And you already know, I've got my whiteboard to help aid this lesson. And I realize th this thing has become a nuisance lately, but let's just deal with it and start explaining why in the world this happens. I must reiterate a thousand times in this video that although we are going to be explaining sound waves in this video as a sine wave like this, in reality sound is variations in sound pressure in the air particles in the air. And it's particularly going to be important for this lesson because I want you to visualize that. I'm going to be drawing this, but I want you to visualize the variations in sound pressure in the air, okay? So just keep that in mind, please. In order to simplify the lesson today, we are going to explain this on a bi-directional or pressure gradient microphone today specifically how it relates to a ribbon microphone. This is a really basic diagram of a ribbon microphone where this line here is the ribbon. This is of course going to be true for a cardioid microphone or a phase shifting microphone. Now the reason this is called a pressure gradient microphone is that this ribbon is going to be reacting to the differences in pressure on this side of the microphone compared to this side of the microphone. That gradient there is what is going to flex this ribbon each in which way. And it's important to realize that the bigger the pressure difference between the sides of the ribbon microphone, the more the ribbon is going to flex and subsequently the higher the volume will subsequently be. This ribbon is going to be seeing a pressure gradient for two main reasons. The first being the inverse square law and the second being variations in sound pressure of a frequency. Let's first focus on the inverse square law and how it creates a pressure gradient for a ribbon microphone. To remind you on the inverse square law, this says that the intensity of your signal, in this case it would be volume, is going to be proportional to the inverse of the distance from your signal source squared. Now, if you look at this diagram that I put on the screen, you will see why as a sound travels away from a point source that it spreads out into a sphere and the farther away you get from the signal source, it has to fill more and more volume of this sphere. That is why the intensity drops off so dramatically as distance increases. So here I drew out a rough visual representation of what the amplitude of a sound wave might look like leaving a speaker. When it first comes out of the speaker, it is the amplitude is very large, so the signal is loud, and it quickly drops off and tapers off, like so. Now, because the amplitude drops off as the inverse squared here, the difference between, say, point here and point here is going to be a much bigger difference in amplitude than, let's say, the same distance but moved here. 
To further clarify, the distance I am drawing out here is the front of the ribbon microphone to the back of the ribbon microphone. So in this graph, I have an upper right corner. The blue line is signifying the front of the ribbon and the yellow line is signifying the rear of the ribbon. All right, so I blew up these two sections of the same distance of this sound wave and put them up here. So this section is right here and this section is right here. Now, if you compare the tops of each of these waves, you will see that for this one, the difference in amplitude is much greater than the difference in amplitude for these two crests of the sound wave. To summarize, because of the inverse square law, for distances close to the signal source, there is a much bigger difference in amplitude as compared to distances farther away from the signal source. So let's draw this principle onto this chart. And you're going to be seeing this chart a bunch through the rest of the video, so let's explain what we're looking at here. On the uh, x-axis, we have the range of frequencies that we're concerned about in the audio spectrum going from 20 hertz all the way to 20 kilohertz. And on the y-axis, we have the change in pressure, which results in volume as we go up. So the higher we go up, the more change in pressure, which subsequently will mean more signal from the microphone and then more volume. Okay, so now I have six lines drawn here, each with a different distance from the signal source, starting at one inch, three inch, six inch, one foot, two foot, and six foot. These numbers are relative, they're not important, I just chose them for uh, easy learning purposes, okay? And basically what I wanna show you here is two things. The first being that because of the inverse square law, the closer you get to the signal source, the more pressure difference there is going to be, which will cause the ribbon in the ribbon microphone to flex more, which will cause more of a voltage signal and subsequently more volume. That is the first important thing we must see here. The second thing we must see here is that for the inverse square law, it is even for all frequencies. So 20 hertz is going to react just the same as 20 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz rather. It is the same, really important. Those two things, keep that in mind. And as you can see, once you get away from close miking a signal source, the inverse square law barely has any influence on the change in pressure and subsequently the volume that the, mic the microphone is going to be producing. It is really only crucial for when you are close miking. Okay, now let's move on to the second way a pressure gradient or a bi-directional microphone is going to be picking up sound. All right, so we have two frequencies drawn here, each with the same amplitude, meaning they are the same volume, just different frequencies. For the, same, for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna call this 200 hertz and this one 100 hertz. And I apologize for repeating myself, but I must remind you that in actuality, sound doesn't travel through the air as sine waves. It travels as variations of uh, pressure in the air, of the actual air particles. And the reason I'm reiterating this once again in this video is because it is really important to understand that, to understand why this principle works and why a pressure gradient microphone is going to work in this manner. So really, when we draw out sine waves like this, the crest of the waves are going to be where the air particles are squished together, and the trough of the waves are going to be where the uh, air particles are most retracted from one another. That is where you get the variations in pressure. Please visualize that, as I'm not gonna draw that out. Or maybe I'll put a little diagram here to show you what I'm talking about. So let's go back to the diagram of a simple ribbon microphone where we have the ribbon and this is going to be reacting to the variations or the pressure gradient from one side of the ribbon to the other side of the ribbon. Now let's just say for simplicity's sake that the distance between the front and the rear of this microphone is going to be distance D. Let's draw this out on the two waves. 
All right, so I drew out the distance D on these two signal waves. I conveniently put the first point at the null of each of these waves. And what we're looking at is the amplitude of the wave for that second point, the rear of the microphone here. And you can see that on the 100 hertz signal, the amplitude difference between these two points is much smaller than the amplitude difference of these two points on the 200 hertz wave. And this principle is going to hold true the higher you go in frequency. The higher you go, the more of an amplitude difference or a pressure difference you are going to see on either side of the microphone. And the bigger pressure difference you see, the more voltage and subsequently more volume you are going to get. So let's once again draw this out on the graph I showed earlier. Okay, so I drew out the same graph. Just a reminder, we have the change in pressure. The higher you go, the more volume or decibels you're gonna get. And on the x-axis, you have 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now, this principle I just explained with pressure differences due to frequencies is going to look something like this. The higher in frequency you go, the more change in pressure you're gonna go, subsequently more volume. Now this effect actually works at 6 dB per octave of gain increase. Now if you remember, the inverse square law did not care what frequency you were recording. It only cared about the distance between the signal source and the microphone. This is the exact opposite. This principle is extremely dependent on the frequency, but it is independent of the distance from the microphone. This microphone can be an inch, six inches, a foot, 10 feet, it doesn't matter. You're going to be seeing the same relative 6 dB per octave of increase for a bi-directional microphone. Now I am going to add those inverse square lines into this graph to symbolize how a microphone is going to react to both principles working in tandem. Okay, so I have drawn in these lines and remember that the numbers I'm showing here are just relative numbers. They're not meant to be mathematical. They're just meant to make this lesson a little easier. So for the first line, I have, let's just say two feet. The second line, I have one foot away from the signal source. And finally, three inches away from that source. Now, you will see that for a situation where your microphone is two feet away from your signal source, it's not going to be seeing any pressure differences from the uh, inverse square law. It's going to be seeing it all from that pressure gradient difference. As you move to one foot, you're gonna see once you get down to some of the lower frequencies that the inverse square law is gonna start to take over. This is going to be more true the closer you get. Let's look at the three inch line. Now you will see that the overall frequency response of this microphone is gonna look something like this. Oh boy. Okay, I drew that a little better. See, the overall frequency response for that microphone at three inches is going to look something like that, where at the lower frequencies, you're seeing a linear frequency response, and at the higher frequencies, you're seeing that 6 dB per octave increase. Now, the frequency curves that I have drawn here would not be ideal for a microphone at all. If your frequency curve looked like that, you would not be getting a usable result. So, microphone designers have to account for this, and they do it with something called damping. By damping, I mean the engineers are going to design the microphone such that it is not as sensitive to high frequencies as compared to low frequencies. They are essentially going to take this non-linear response that I have drawn here and straighten it out so that there's no more 6 dB per octave increase. Now they are either going to do this to physical means of dampening the diaphragm and the moving coil, or they are going to do this electrically with electronic components. Do keep in mind that for most working distances for a microphone, the inverse square law is not going to have precedence over the 6 dB per octave linear response. That is why they choose to compensate for this effect. Let us draw out what the graph is going to look like when they compensate for this 6 dB per octave increase. 
Okay, so now I have those same three inverse square law lines drawn, and that 6 dB per octave pressure gradient line is now flatlined. By damping the microphone, they neutralize this once previous nonlinear response. And by doing that, you're essentially turning the whole graph clockwise, right? So now, for a two foot away microphone, it is going to be seeing just a flat frequency response. For the one foot, it's going to be seeing a flat frequency response until the very end of the low end spectrum. And for a three inch microphone, we're going to be seeing a flat frequency response and then a boost in the low end. That is where the proximity effect comes from, right here. That compensation. So in actuality, this proximity effect is the result of microphones being designed with damping. And remember that damping is to compensate for that 6 dB per octave nonlinear response. And the reason omnidirectional microphones don't see this pronounced proximity effect is because the back of the diaphragm is within a sealed enclosure and it is not seeing any pressure change as a result of the signal sound source. I really, really hope that I did a good job explaining why the proximity effect exists. I have seen many different explanations on the internet that are just completely incorrect. This explanation here with this graphs, I got directly from the microphone company Shure. And if Shure ain't Shure, I ain't Shure, and you certainly ain't Shure. So stop calling me Shirley. This is the correct way. I believe the physics here all make sense. There might be some other minor effects due to diffraction and stuff like that, but I think this is the quintessential reason why physically the proximity effect exists. Now this lesson probably would have been a little better if I had more than one color of a dry erase marker, but your boy can't afford that because you guys don't subscribe or something to my channel and give me ad money or something, okay? Um, yeah. If you guys uh, learned something here, if you haven't seen my video on microphone design basics, go watch that. Go watch the three to one rule. Hopefully you guys are starting to like these more like physical uh, or physics rather educational videos. Also, I bought a fancy light. Is it even better? Is it even better with the light? I think it's a little better. Tell me if it's better. I spent too much money on that light. All right, let's end this video. Um, yeah. Uh, awkward pause into the camera. Okay. Alright, good night. Picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue.